All right. As Ishmael mentioned, um, I'm here to introduce the participants in the topic. And I'm trying to, here we go. The topic today is the legality of Israeli settlements from the perspective of international law. Why are we talking about this? Inevitably, when you talk about Israel, the Arab-Israeli conflict, we talk about settlements and legal claims are made. So we want to talk about whether these settlements are legal or not under international law. And we're going to laser focus on international law. It's not about what are the, the best politics of the settlements. It's not about um, whether the settlements are good politics or whether they're morally right. We're talking about whether they're legal under international law. So what are the Israeli settlements? They weren't around forever. Um, until 1917, the, the area of Palestine was under Ottoman rule. And there were, the area was divided. For some reason, my maps aren't coming up on this one. But what happened was, the, F5. Five, F5? F5. Well, yeah. here, the area was under Ottoman rule until 1917, at the time when the Ottomans lose World War I, and at the time, in 1914, they were under, this area was under territorial divisions of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottomans lose, the area is put under the League of Nations mandate system, which gave these lands assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. So the, the purple areas, the Palestinian area was under the British mandate. The Brits exercise Article 25 and give and transfer Transjordan to Arab control in 1923. So from 1923 to 1947, the area of Palestine, including the West Bank and Gaza, is under the British mandate. What happens then? They couldn't come to an agreement, the, the Arabs and the Jews, and there was a war ending in Jordan occupying the West Bank and Egypt occupying Gaza was the result of the war. That was the situation until 1967 when what happened, there's another war and Israel occupies quote unquote the red areas including the West Bank Gaza and the Sinai, and up until 1967, there were no settlers, no settlements. Here's a map, I mean, here's a, a graph that shows you from 1966, there were no, um, there was no Jewish population in the West Bank, it steadily grows, and, and in Gaza, there are some settlements which are uh, dismantled in 2005, in the Golan Heights, there are settlements, and this is a a bar graph of the increase in the number of Jewish settlers in the West Bank since 1967. And so here's the current situation of the West Bank with the blue being the settlements, which we're talking about today. So our question today is, are these settlements legal under international law? What is international law? International law are treaties and custom um, where people act with a sense of legal obligation, custom, and internationally recognized customary regulations, and also treaties where countries bind themselves. Those are the two main sources of international law. The main, one of the main sources we'll be talking about today is what we mentioned. After World War I, the League of Nations, which is the predecessor to the UN, established by the Treaty of Versailles, the mandate system to give assistance by a mandatory in these areas, as, I, as we said, um, until they can stand alone. One of the biggest is the, that we're going to be talking about today is the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, quote unquote, the preamble in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Recognition given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. So then the League of Nations is replaced by the UN 
UN Security Council resolutions are also binding sources of international law. So under Article 25 of the UN Charter, the, the members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council. And a very important UN Security Council, uh, UN Security Council resolution is 242, which establishes uh, for a just and lasting peace, withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. So lastly, we're going to go to also the Geneva Convention. The fourth Geneva Convention is a binding source of international law. Article 49, Section 6, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. Other sources of international law or any other treaty where a country agrees to be bound or, recon or, or recognize customary international rule. What are not binding sources of international law? Resolutions from the United Nations General Assembly, because rulemaking is not one of its functions. Also, you may have heard of an international court of justice opinion in 2004. That's by its own definition an advisory opinion, not a binding opinion. They, they issued their own um, advice on the situation. So to recap, we're talking about these settlements under international law, um, which is the League of Nations we spoke about, UN Security Council resolutions, Fort Geneva Convention, other treaties or customary laws, and the debate will be with Professor Eugene Kantorovich, Professor of Law at Northwestern University School of Law, and Omar Jaffrey, um, who has been an associate at Jenner and Block since 2008. So the format of the debate, Professor Kantorovich with a 14-minute opening, Mr. Jaffrey with a 14-minute rebuttal, Professor Kantorovich with a, a five minute counter rebuttal, and then Mr. Joffrey finishing off with a five minute sir rebuttal. Thank you very much for everyone attending. And um, maybe, uh, should we do the pizza? I very? <laughs> I, I know I'm more convincing if people do the pizza. I'm sure okay, why don't we do, a, everyone, since the pizza's arrived, we'll do a, a short pizza for everyone to get ready, and we'll start off with Professor Contour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Challenge that wide, uh, and acknowledge while the, while the view, while wild, widely held, has no basis in the letter, spirit, or history of international law, nor does it accord with state practice. That is to say, it does not accord with how these relevant provisions of international law have been applied anywhere else uh, except Israel. Now, to be clear, there is no international legal concept of settlement. That is to say, settlement is not a term of art in international law. Rather, the appropriate term, and I think there's a reason it doesn't get uh, settlement, is used instead. Settlement is simply the translation of the, of the Hebrew word yeshuv, which means small new village. Uh, and it applies to Jewish communities on either side of the Green Line. The only relevant international uh, legal provision, which the Jewish uh, Israeli civilian presence in the West Bank is said to violate, is Article 49, subsection 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. This one particular sentence. So if, we ha if we're going to find a reason for illegality, it has to be right here in these words. The occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. Note, it does not say the occupying power of civilians shall not settle or shall be forbidden from settling. It doesn't say anything about the word settling. Note, it doesn't say about building houses, which is often what the discussions are. Like. The occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its civilian population. That is the central prohibition that uh, settlements are said to violate. It is contained in this one sentence. Now, what is Article 49 in general about? Article 49 has six provisions. This is the last. The first five of them are all about one thing, what we call ethnic cleansing, kicking out the population of the occupied territory. And then the sixth provision is, uh, is this one. And all of them together were particularly in response, as the International Red Cross's commentary and the history of the drafting made clear, to German policies, in particular in Poland and Ukraine, of kicking out the people who were there uh, and uh, transferring Germans 
into those areas. We'll talk about what that, uh, what that means. But the first question is, before we wonder, are the, uh, are the terms of Article 49.6 satisfied? Is, does the Geneva Convention apply? Right? The Geneva Convention is a treaty. And it, does not, it, it, uh, it is not a principle of natural law. And there are circumstances in which it applies and circumstances in which it doesn't. And there's a pretty strong argument that the Geneva Convention does not apply in the West Bank. By the way, the Golan Heights would be different. So there's a difference between the West Bank and the Golan Heights in this respect. Why? So Article 2 of the Geneva Convention, which explains when it applies, says it shall apply to claims of partial or total occupation of the territory of a high contracting party. In other words, a member, a signatory of the treaty. This makes sense. The Geneva Convention is a treaty. It's a deal between countries. And like most deals, it pr principally applies uh, with respect to the parties to it. Now, the question is, was the West Bank the territory of a high contracting party? The only plausible candidate for that in 1967 would be Jordan. That was the power that was occupying the West Bank at the time. However, the uh, West Bank was never regarded as part of Jordan's territory, because when Jordan invaded the League of Nations mandate for Palestine in 1948, in the uh, Israeli War of Independence, uh, the Nakba, as it's also known, uh, its occupation of that was never uh, regarded as transferring valid title. In other words, the occupation of Palestine began not in 1967, but in 1949 by Jordan. So the West Bank was not the territory in the sovereign sense of Jordan, uh, making it quite unclear whether uh, whether Geneva Convention applies. Now, international lawyers will say, no, 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 it also applies to this case, but it seems to not quite align with the text. Right? That is to say, the green line that existed from 19, uh, uh, 1949 to 1967 was not a political or territorial boundary according to its own terms. Thus, it did not create Jordanian territory. Here's another reason to think the Geneva Convention does not apply to the West Bank. Again, what was the policy of Article 49 cent? It's about German colonization of Ukraine and Poland was what it was based on. And what did Ukraine and Poland both have in common? Well, they were clearly not part of Germany before the war. And that's the notion in which it was colonial. Under the League of Nations mandate, under one of the operative provisions, Jews are specifically given the right to close settlement of the land. Indeed, this is the only time that the word settlement appears in these international instruments. So settlement in the entirety of Palestine, that is to say what you'd call Israel and the West Bank, was a right specifically secured by the League of Nations. In other words, in other words, the entire territory is, in a sense, part of the same political unit. And I don't want to, I, I do this just for purposes of oversimplification, but if one would roughly say, uh, I'll, I'll hold on this one. Uh, but it seems, it's not clear how can you settle territory which has been given by the international community as a place for you to settle. How could that be uh, a crime? That is to say, Article 49.6 implies that there's two different territories the high contracting party's territory, and a foreign place somewhere else. But under the League of Nations mandate, the entire place is given the same status for purposes of Jewish settlement. <coughs> you can't colonize yourself. And indeed, just to correct uh, or elaborate on a point uh, Jacob made, it's true that the Jewish settlements began in 1967, in the sense that all of the Jews in the West Bank fled or were expelled by the uh, Arab Legion, the Jordanian army, but there were indeed Jewish communities in these areas uh, prior to 1949, and <coughs> the original new Jewish communities after 1967 returned to the same places. Now, there is one other example in international law of a similar situation confronting the international community. You've never heard of it because it's not the Israeli-Palestinian situation, uh, but uh, during the um, Vietnamese-Cambodian War, which you've probably never heard of, uh, but was quite a big thing in its day, uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, several hundred thousand Vietnamese settlers came into Vietnamese. Several hundred Vietnamese came from Vietnam and moved into Cambodia. Uh, they were ethnic Vietnamese enemies. Then they moved into uh, Cambodia, which is a majority Khmer population. Uh, how many were there? Estimates range from 200,000 to 500,000, because we did not have a peace now for Vietnam and Cambodia to count every single one. But let's say 300,000. Uh, as part of the internationally backed peace plan in 1999, the Paris Accords, Henry Kissinger, everyone was part of this, uh, the Cambodians had many demands that the, A, the Vietnamese army leave, and B, that all these Vietnamese leave. And we don't like these Vietnamese. They're, we don't get along, which is true. Uh, 
Now, the response of the international community was lots of these Vietnamese had previously resided in Cambodia. So they're not strangers here. Yes, they might be Vietnamese nationals, but they're not coming to a foreign place in the sense which international law prohibits. That is to say, in the 1970s, several hundred thousand Vietnamese fled from uh, Cambodia to Vietnam. These weren't all the same people that were coming back, but there was some overlap, and the international community said treating these as settlers who have to go is entirely illegitimate. That's a pretty close uh, analogy, and indeed all of them uh, were allowed to stay. But let's move on. Let's assume that Article 49.6 does apply, even though it's not the territory of the occupying power, even though it was reserved by the League of Nations uh, for a close settlement by, uh, by the Jews. Um, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer its own civilian population. Who can violate Article 49.6? Article 49.6 is simply a prohibition on actions by the occupying power. That's the government of Israel. In other words, it might for whatever it forbids, it forbids the government of Israel from doing. The international community wants to read Article 49.6 as if it says something quite different. As if it says, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer its own civilian population. And if they want to go themselves, shall prevent them. And if they manage to make it anyway, shall make their life difficult or harass them or kick them out somehow. That might be a good rule, but that's not what it says. It's limited to actions of the occupying power. And that's what the precedent was. And let me just give you two examples. Let me just give you two examples. Poland and France. Poland and Germany occupied both of them. It's clear from the drafting history that this was about German colonial action in Poland. What did Germany do? Germany didn't just say, hey, Germans, you can come over to Poland. We'll give you a tax break later. Rather, they rounded up German farmers. They actually put them in particular camps and education centers, taught them how to farm these areas, had processes for picking them, processes for ensuring who was the most German and sending them there, uh, and then actually got them on buses and on trains and uh, shipped them to the relevant places. Did Germans move to France? Yes, Germans also moved to France, but not as part of a colonization program. Rather, they just moved, it was under German occupation. And no one has suggested that 49.6 was a response to Germans moving to territories under German occupation, rather than the particular colonial projects in uh, Poland and the Ukraine. What's transfer mean anyway? What does transfer mean anyway? It's interesting, so this is uh, the point I was going to uh, suggest before. Vaguely, very vaguely, very imperfectly, the position that settlements are illegal, I would just roughly like to align with maybe the left, just for purposes of this point. But it's funny, so people who generally would not like Newt wrong, generally speaking. But on the other hand, it seems that if you're to think that Jews buying a house in uh, the old city of Jerusalem and moving there would constitute deportation or transfer, it's like Newt Romney says, self-deportation. How can you, you self-deport? Okay. How can you self-deport? What does transfer mean? What does transfer mean? Transfer means, quite simply, the government taking people and moving them. Now, people argue based on the contrast of the language in 49.1, where it says forcible transfers, that the transfers in 49.6 don't need to be compelled, i.e. at gunpoint, unlike when you're kicking out the people who are already there. This is surely true, but there's a difference between people moving themselves and people moving at gunpoint, which is namely people moving in organized government projects. That's exactly what the history uh, that's exactly what the history reflected, and all other uses of uh, the word transfer elsewhere in the Geneva Convention clearly refer to organized mandatory transfers. For example, Article 45, protected persons shall not be transferred to a power which is not a party, uh, where they may have a reason to fear persecution. Clearly, this, uh, this does not mean they're voluntarily transferring themselves, uh, but rather they're being sent. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, let me conclude with uh, perhaps the most important point. Usually we interpret ambiguous language in international law, or controversial language in international law, through state practice. How have these provisions been interpreted elsewhere? Now, you probably only think that uh, the only settlements in the world ever are Israeli settlements. But indeed, we have many, many examples of settlements, just some uh, salient, salient examples. Tons and tons, very nearby, Syria and Lebanon, to this very day, Turkey and Cyprus. The majority of people in Turkish occupied northern Cyprus are Turkish settlers. The majority, compared to about 20% Israeli settlers in, in, the, uh, in the West Bank. And in none of these cases, none of these cases of clear occupation and varying degrees of civilian population migration, sometimes more organized by the government, sometimes less, in none of these cases has the international community ever suggested that there is a 49-6 violation. There hasn't been a General Assembly resolution. There hasn't been any suggesting a 49-6 violation. 
Now, of course, one could say, well, just because they're getting away with it doesn't mean Israel's not violating the law. But that's not how international law works. How do you even figure out what is a violation? You look how this language has been interpreted in state practice. In international law, state practice is the substitute, really, for judicial, uh, judicial precedent. And in none of these cases do we have a 49-6 uh, condemnation. More importantly, in several of these cases, there have been a UN-brokered Security Council-endorsed peace plan. In the case of Western Sahara, Turkey, East Timor, most of them unsuccessful except for East Timor, uh, in not one of these peace plans has a single settler been required to leave, suggesting that the notion that uh, the expulsion of uh, those there um, is not the remedy. Final point, okay. Maybe certain levels of government support for, uh, for rounding, for sending people uh, into uh, occupied territory, maybe that would constitute transfer. Again, we have no other cases in which a transfer has ever been found, including Indonesian mass roundups and sending to East Timor. So we don't really know. But one thing, one thing I would at least insist on, transfer. Let's say someone born in the West Bank, an Israeli born in the West Bank, have they been transferred? It would stretch any understanding of the English language. They've been delivered. They've been delivered. So to speak of settlements generally, whatever one thinks the level of government involvement needed to qualify as a government activity and qualify as a transfer, it seems it's impossible to speak of settlements as a blanket concept. Right? That is to say, each person who winds up in occupied territory, there's a question. Did the government, was the government involved? And was it a transfer? Uh, in some cases, that may be the case. In some cases, that may not be the case. That is a highly fact-specific inquiry and not one that could be uh, uh, spoken of in broad international law terms. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I think I wanted to begin from the beginning and talk about the Palestine mandate because a lot of it is based on the idea that the language in it that said that Israel, that Jewish people can basically establish a national home means that they can either have a state or that they can make these settlements. Article 6 is something that Professor Kondorovich talked about. Um, in his slide, he mentioned uh, Article 6 and how it allowed Jewish settlement of the land. But what, he, what his slide uh, basically left out was that it said that the settlements under Article 6 of the mandate will only be allowed so long as they don't prejudice the rights of the inhabitants of that land at that point. So that's the critical aspect. Now what that means under perhaps you know, a contemporary context is that you don't bulldoze Palestinian <coughs> homes to create settlements through government action. Now that under the mandate is prohibited, even under the mandate of the Palestinians. Now uh, even under the mandate of Palestine in 1922. But here's what the most important thing about the mandate is is that it's not really relevant to the discussion as of today. The mandate language basically said that the inhabitants of Palestine had reached a stage of development where their status as independent nations could be provisionally recognized. The purpose of the mandate was to prepare those people, the inhabitants of the land, for self-government. Now, yes, was there tension with the mandate for Palestine that said that the Jews, that the Jewish people can have uh, a national home there, yes. But even the Balfour Declaration, um, which essentially was a tussle between pro-Zionist Jews and anti-Zionist Jews, and many Jews in the cabinet of the British, uh, essentially the first language, the first first draft of the Balfour Declaration said that the reconstitution of Palestine as a Jewish state and as the national home of the Jewish people should be established. That was the first draft. That language makes it crystal clear that there is a distinguishable factor between the word Jewish state and national home for the Jews. So the, the, the actual draft of the Balfour Declaration, as well as the language and the mandate, never had the word Jewish state. Think about that, that's important. So it was always assumed that national home and Jewish state are not synonymous. Now in context, what that means is the mandate meant it should be a Palestinian state for the Palestinians and yes, the Jews should be allowed to immigrate and settle so that they can grow their communities, but it never ever envisioned that that would happen while it prejudiced the <coughs> rights of the inhabitants, which is how the current settlement structure is based upon, or that essentially these settlements would continue unabated and would have these, this strategic vision of controlling and dominating the land. 
Now, here's another important factor about Article 6, which renders it completely nugatory at this point. The King Crane Commission of 1919 essentially said that the idea of settlement to the Jewish state cannot be done in a way that prejudices.